Welcome back to the Crash Course Podcast. My name is Craig Crash Collins, joined as always by Brandon Scott, otherwise known as B. Scott. We've got a lot to get into tonight. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the Big Ten season. It is our third, B. Scott, our third uh, college football preview of the season. That's just the kind of year uh, we're in right now. Um, as we f- love college football. Oh, that is we true. love college football. Very true. Before um, we did the um, – or before we had just the just talking about college football in general, um, the whole fact of the you know COVID nineteen stuff, and then also then then around the time that the uh, Clemson Tigers and the ACC were getting ready to get going, and the SEC and all them, um, we did a preview for that, and so now we're ready for the Big Ten because the Big Ten will start this weekend, um, and then a couple weekends after that we'll have the Pac twelve, and everybody will be going. So we're about to have we went from having no college football, B Scott, to having just everybody back, and it should be a good season. Yeah, it will be. I mean, we're I think we pretty much will have everybody back here in the within the next two weeks. Uh, the Pac twelve. Mountain West and the Mac. Uh, speaking of the Mac, uh, Ball State released their schedule today. And if you want to watch the Cardinals on TV, this is the year for you. They're pretty much every one of their games is pretty much on TV. I think all of them, but one, are actually going to be on TV, which is going to be awesome. It's going to be really a lot of fun. A lot of Wednesday night games. So I think we're going to get into a time of year now where uh, football of some level should be on every single night. Yeah, it will be. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, I didn't even think about that. Because you'll have the NFL um, doing its thing. I mean, who knows? A lot of NFL or an NFL, you know, you know, you might see an NFL game on a Tuesday. You're going to did last week. Exactly. You're going to see. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get football. You went from having no sports to having football pretty much all the time. And then, of course, we do have the World Series this week, so it should be a lot of fun as well. So this is a good time of year for sports. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, and, and as I mentioned, we've got the world series, um, that's what we're going to kind of open with and touch on. Normally we kind of touch on the Colts game. I'm just glad the Colts came back and won. Cause if we had to talk about the Colts losing to the Bengals, that would have been a whole other story. Um, so we're just going to gloss right past that because we're just happy the Colts have their fourth win of the season. Uh, we'll, we'll be happy that the, we'll blame, we'll blame that first quarter performance on the fact that their facility got shut down at the last second Friday morning True. and kind of threw off their game prep and everything. We'll, we'll, we'll chalk it up to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, <laughs> so let's go ahead and hop into the World Series. It is going to be the Rays and the Dodgers. It was a great uh, – it's been a great postseason so far for the Rays. They sweep – um, the Blue Jays in the first round. Uh, then in the second round, they go to five games. They go the full five against the Yankees. They knock off the Yankees. Mike Brousseau, the big hero in that one, getting the uh, home run in the bottom of the eighth inning there. Um, and then um, the next time out uh, against the, you know, it was the top of the ninth, I think. Something like that. It was late in the game. And then, of course, uh, up 3 0 against the Astros. Uh, the game, the series ends up going to a game seven as the Astros then win three straight, but then the Rays take care of business four to two in game seven. They go to their first World Series since two thousand and eight, and then the Braves had a three one lead. What is this about Atlanta teams and having leads? It just seems to happen that way. It's funny because it kind of comes full circle. So when we first started the podcast uh, three years ago, the first podcast we did was Georgia Alabama. And Georgia had a lead. I think it was like a fourteen nothing lead at halftime against Alabama, and Alabama came like, back and. I think it was like twenty to seven. Well, that was I this. Saw, I saw a graphic on it today. That's what, that's what this one was. Not not the national championship. Oh. That's what I'm talking about a couple years ago. <laughs> um, Georgia had a closeout games. Right, exactly. So that's why I'm saying it, come, it came full circle because you had that. Back in uh, <laughs> you had that back in when the first po- the podcast first started because that was also around the time um you know later that year we had the memes for the Falcons blowing the Super Bowl against the Patriots and now three games to one the Braves were leading um yeah and then of course Georgia blows a big lead against Alabama this week as well twenty to seven is what the score was at, at that point so Atlanta teams not doing very good with leads. Uh, the Braves had a 3-1 lead. Looked like they were going to pretty much cruise through the Dodgers. 
Um, and then the Dodgers win three straight. Cody Bellinger, uh, a late home run uh, to give the Dodgers the Game 7 win. And so now it will be Rays and Dodgers. And B. Scott, we talked about this a little bit off air. I was, you know, I basically, I didn't care um, who won the World Series this year after the Cub Cubs got eliminated. And, of course, the Padres get eliminated. So, you know, the two teams I had picked to go to the World Series had both been eliminated. My favorite team, the Cubs, had been eliminated. So, you know what? I had one goal in mind. I had one thing that I wanted to see happen, and that was the Astros lose. And they gave me a little bit of a heart attack. I even tweeted it out. Um, I think it was on Saturday, uh, the day of Game 7. I was like, you know, it's, it's the most 2020 thing ever that a team of cheaters who then self-proclaim themselves as losers go through an entire season, don't get to face any fan ridicule, and then they're going to win the whole damn thing. And so I was like, of course that's what's going to happen this year. That seems like the year to do it, uh, but the Rays pay off for me big. So I'm very glad. Now, I really couldn't care less. The Dodgers were my preseason pick. Um, they have looked strong all season, obviously. Um, you know, now there's there's some question marks. Walker Bueller had, had a pretty decent LCS. Um, he's not had the greatest season overall, however. And then Clayton Kershaw, we all know about his kind of Peyton Manning-esque tendencies in the playoffs. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But, of course, the Bats, um, you know, had you know had the big resurgence in Game 5 um, with the 11-run uh, first inning. Um, got him back into it. You've got Cody Bellinger, Max Muncy. Um, Corey Seager had a, one hell of a LCS. Um, he gets uh, MVP. So, I mean, it'll be very fun because these two teams are very, very similar. Um, they both have strong bullpens. They both have solid starting pitching. Not the greatest, but solid. And both have very stacked lineups. So, at the very least, it should be fun. Yeah, I mean, like I told you off air, I was just glad it was anybody but the Yankees. Um, personally, I, I was hoping that the Braves would have been able to pull it out just because I just think that would have been fun. The Rays and the Braves, who would have thought? And then, you know, those two teams playing so close to each other, home base wise. And then I think they're, are they playing, where are they playing this game? Dallas? They're, they're, yeah, they're going to be playing this game. It, it's been a very weird postseason. The Dodgers have played, ever since beating the Brewers in the first round, they have played every series at Globe Life Park. Uh, the Rays played obviously at home for the first round then they played in san diego for the al for the rest of the al playoffs interesting is i actually i noticed they actually were allowing fans in into the stadium in dallas yeah so that's kind of cool um but yeah i was kind of hoping for the braves just because i think that would have been a cool story and it just you know because the dodgers seem to always most of the time are always there um but I'm torn on who I want. Do I want to keep it in the AL East, you know, or do I want to see Mookie get another one and get the Dodgers finally get over that hump? Um, you know, I honestly, I think, I think be, because of how many times they've been there and been so close and have it, have, had it taken away. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go with the Dodgers ultimately in this. I think that, I think it's going to be a, a a better series than most people may predict it to be. I mean, hey, the Rays were still the best team in the AL. They had the best record in the AL this season. Um, but I just – I don't think they're quite on the same level as the Dodgers. I mean, the Dodgers have the bats. They have the pitching. And, my goodness, do they have the defense. How many home runs did Mookie rob in the C in the LCS? Dude, Mookie was an absolute monster. Out of this world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Sox, we were all sitting there going, are you kidding me? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Ah, uh, best yeah. player in baseball. Best player in baseball, hands down. Yeah, basically, basically, like up in that conversation of like Mike Trout for like the best player in baseball, as far and if not, like you said, the I best player in baseball. He's best, I think he so, is the best player in baseball. But like, definitely somebody. I mean, because you think about like what it would take to move Mike Trout and what it actually did take to move Mookie Betts, and it's a little, <laughs> it's a little. It's a little uh, eye-opening, um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I don't think it took. I mean, I, I think it, there could have been more. I don't think the Red Sox truly got everything they possibly could have for Mookie Betts. Oh no, 
but just knowing how much he was going to cost, I think that's what a lot of teams were. And and also, it was a time where there there was very much uncertainty about whether or not the season would be played. And I think this was the last year of Mookie's contract, wasn't it? Or it no? was, going into this season was his last year. Yeah, so I mean, traded, when he got traded, there was I mean, COVID wasn't a thing yet. Um, but it was how much do you want to spend on a potential rental? Yeah. And then Mookie turned around and signed a massive extension. Right. So, so yeah, it, yeah I'm, I'm going with the Dodgers to win this World Series just because it's about time. Yeah. Unfortunately I, for the Rays. I I don't know who I want to pick either, and it's because I, I think the Rays are a good story. I won't be upset if they win. You know, I talked to you know, we talked off air a little bit about the fact that, you know, I uh, John Boy uh, media, I watch a lot of that. They're a big, you know, baseball podcast and baseball media company and and uh, you know, basically the Dodgers are they, they've said that, you know, the Rays, you know, are this kind of, you know, scrappy team, got the great bullpen, you know, got, you know, the good bats, got the pitching staff. Um, and then basically the Dodgers are the Rays with money. They've been able to go out and pay guys, uh, you know, massive extensions or sign guys to contracts. And, um, you know, it just hasn't worked out for them. So it is kind of a David versus Goliath in that aspect. But these two teams are actually very evenly matched, very similar um i'm very interested i'm very i'm very excited to see how this world series plays out um you know i i i kind of want to go ahead and stick with the dodgers as well only because they were my preseason pick so the fact that they got there um i do you know it's kind of a it's kind of a win-win you either get the dodgers who finally after all the uh all the adversity you know dealing with the buzzsaw that was the red sox i'm not even going to mention the little minor like stuff that went on you know that was part of a cheating scandal there as well and then of course the cheating scandal um you know it, you know last year with the astros and, and nationals i really didn't have you know i didn't really have a preference either way in that one but i'm sure as heck glad the nationals won um you know i was telling i was telling some people yesterday i said you know what my one goal or my my one like hope for the Astros organization. I was like, I hope they don't win another World Series with this core of players. So they can win after all Tuve and Correa and Bregman are all gone. I don't care. But I I don't want them to win. I want their one World Series together to be tainted. Um, but, you know, and, and so I think it would be great for the Dodgers. I think it would be great for Clayton Kershaw. We saw Peyton Manning get to have his, you know, moment of finally getting over the hump playoff-wise. Um, and then it, it might be nice to see the Rays win as well because I think that, um, you know, we've always kind of made this comparison when we talk about the Pacers. The Rays are the Pacers of baseball. Um, they're just managed a little bit differently where, you know, they've got a few guys that you recognize the names of, but for the most part it's, you know, it's like the meme I've seen on Twitter where it's like, you know, they'll post, uh, you know, one side, it's, you know, when they beat the Yankees, the one side was like, you know, uh, the, you know, the the you know mo the I can't think of what I want to say the most valuable franchise in all of sports in the Yankees and then the other you know versus some dude named Randy for Randy Rosarena from the Rays because uh, he's been absolutely raking he was the AL uh, MVP or ALCS MVP so um, you know it, it's a bunch of you know it's a, it's a more of a complete team rather than hey we've got some big bats and then we've got some guys that you know hey if they have a good month can help carry us to you know, the, to the title, um, you know, it, it's a complete, it's more of a complete team. So it'll be fun to watch. I, I think I'm going to go Dodgers as well, though. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be the Dodgers. Um, and if it's not, won't be mad if it's the race. Yeah. Either way, I'll be, I'll be okay with it. Um, I don't know. We'll see yeah. uh, how it goes. I think it could be a good series. I hope it's a good series. Oh, I, I really do. I hope it's not a Dodger blowout to be honest I don't think I, it I, will be I, I think a competitive series. the only thing that could kind of lean that way because both teams are battle tested but really the Dodgers are the least of the two that are battle tested so if you want to go that route and say well you know the Rays did have to go to five to beat the Yankees and they did have to go to seven to beat the Astros uh, but in, in the Dodgers those teams are really good right 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 so I'm, I'm just saying that that's like kind of the only thing that might that might theoretically point to the Rays not playing as well, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think the series is going to go six or seven. I hope so. That'd be good. So let's go ahead um, and hop into our main uh, focus tonight. But before we do that, let's go ahead 
um, and uh, let you know that make sure you can follow us on Twitter at Crash Course FM. Like us on Facebook, Crash Course Podcast. Uh, remember to go to our YouTube channel, Crash Course Podcast, there as well. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure you check that out. We are going to be on the NLCS uh, Game 6 between the Dodgers and the Cubs. So if you want to watch some extra baseball, that's going to be coming out on Friday. Don't You won't want to miss that. And then remember, you can listen to us every week on iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever podcasts can be heard, uh, you can hear the Crash Course Podcast. So before we get into the Big Ten, uh, you know, just a little quick update on the season so far. Uh, the top five looks like this. Uh, number one, Clemson. They are 5-0. and oh. They absolutely smacked Georgia Tech this past weekend. Alabama gets the win over Georgia. They are 4-0. and oh. uh, They're at number two. Number three, Notre Dame, 4-0. and oh. Barely squeaked past Louisville this week. So this appears When is Notre Dame actually going to play on the road? I don't know. I I, 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 with this year, I have no idea how like everything's scheduled they got, out. But they pretty much got every tough game that they have on their schedule from the ACC. They get at home. Right. The every only tough one. I think the only one they may have to go to Florida State. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, in Florida State, watch out for that game because they know. they knocked off uh, UNC. Which, got them going down there. Yeah. So I was really actually very surprised about that one. Um, and then number four is Georgia. Uh, they're three and one. And then um, you've got Ohio State, who hasn't played a game yet, but they're still number five, um, so that should be fun. Um, Oklahoma State is at number six. They're the Big 12 leader. Their next three games are very interesting, and will kind of show you what how how good the Big 12 will be as far as if they will make it into the college football playoff their next three games. Number 17, Iowa State, uh, Texas, and then at number 20, Kansas State. So those are going to be three really big games. If Oklahoma State can get through that gauntlet, I think it looks pretty pretty solid for them to possibly make the college football playoff and win the Big 12. Um, and since our last college football preview, um, we have uh, we have had Florida lose to Texas A&M. LSU lost again. They lost to Missouri, and then UNC lost to Florida State. So I think uh, you know the UNC loss to Florida State kind of shows us more. I mean, not that it was really in doubt, but that Clemson, you know, even is more solidly going to possibly get Cause you know, I mean, there was a thought that, Hey, maybe North Carolina, they get a good game. You know, maybe they can catch Clemson a little bit or, you know, could it be Miami, which Clemson throttled them since we last talked, um, Notre Dame. I mean, I would, if Notre Dame wasn't looking so lackluster and if they actually had, you know, full capacity of fans, I might be worried about that game that Clemson has. But other than that, I think Clemson looks to be in the driver's seat. And I think the fact that North Carolina has, they almost stumbled against Boston College and then did stumble against Florida State. So that doesn't look as good. And then now the fact that Florida has lost and LSU has lost again, it now looks more like, hey, if the Big Ten and the Big 12 can pull up their end of the bargain, um, we should have, you know, one SEC, one ACC, one Big 12, um, you know, all going to the college football playoffs. So it won't be, we'll yeah, we'll see. Well, but I mean, the thing is too, if Florida beats Georgia, then they will still have the tiebreaker one loss. Then if they play, they'll lose to Alabama, so they'll have two losses. So if you know Ohio State is a one loss Big Ten champ, you know you would you would like to think that that would exclude you know knock the knock the second SEC team out. But yes, we will see. Um, so yeah, that should be uh, interesting to keep an eye on. But let's go ahead now and get into our Big Ten preview. Uh, we're going to look at both the Indiana Hoosiers and we'll go ahead and talk about the uh, Purdue Boilermakers as well. Um, you know, we won't feature the Boiler Boilermakers too much because I know we don't know a whole lot about them typically. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, that's why I put them. That's why I put them last, B Scott, so we didn't. T if, so I could keep the IU stuff short and you could go ramble for twenty minutes about Purdue. I'm I'm, I'm ready for it. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and start with the Hoosiers. Um, they returned 17 starters this season, nine of which are on defense. They've got some solid weapons uh, returning in Michael Penix Jr. He had a good season last year, 69% completion. Uh, almost 1,400 yards, 10 touchdowns, 4 interceptions. They also returned Stevie Scott the third, 845 yards and 10 touchdowns a year ago. And then Wap, uh, Filler, uh, he had 70 catches, over 1,000 yards and 5 touchdowns. So a lot of talent coming back on offense. And then their defense was led last year by Micah McFadden, 60 tackles and one. And a half sacks so they've got a lot of talent um coming back um this season uh you take a look at their schedule their schedule is going to be eight games um well i mean they're all, every big 10 team's schedule is going to be eight games but it's it's tough nine. i think 
technically every Big Ten team will play, end up playing nine. Right, teams. right. Because I and I do like that. By the way, I think that's a cool like I little addition. I think that's something that needs to stay. Yeah, I think that's something that needs to stay. I, I'm with you. I mean, because that's kind of you know you know it's an extra opportunity to showcase you know the Big Ten. I, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely for that. I don't know. Get rid of one of your non-conference games and. Yeah, I that. I would be yeah. down for that. That actually is a really good idea. You play an extra conference. Just so game. everybody knows what it is, um, it's at the end of the regular season. Instead of just the top two teams from each division playing, the top team from each division playing in the Big Ten Championship. So you'll have the number one, number one versus in, in the Big Ten Championship, and then two versus two, three versus three, four versus four, and so on, all down through each division within the big 10 squaring off against each other for that added game so that's why there's that ninth game in the big 10 but we don't know what the matchups are going to look like yet to, because football hasn't even started playing for the big 10 yet no no it does not but iu will get kicked off against number nine penn state then they will go to Rutgers. um then they will play number 19 michigan then they will be on the road for two straight games at michigan state at ohio state maryland um, at number 16, Wisconsin and Purdue. So, you know, before we get into record prediction, you know, I think IU comes back. They've got a lot of talent. Um, oh, yeah, they also have Peyton Hendershot. I know he was kind of a guy who came up, uh, was an up-and-comer, They, uh, you know, last year. So uh, he will be good as well. But, you know, looking at this IU team, they're definitely more formidable. Just It's just the problem. It's the problem that, you know, hey, you know, bring it back to baseball. You know, I, I was talking with a Blue Jays fan the other day, and I was like, it just kind of, you know, they're, they've got a solid foundation. It just stinks that they're in the same, you know, division as the Rays and the, and the Yankees. Um, and so this is the same type of deal, you know, the IU, you know, IU's got a solid team. Um, I think they can, you know, look decent this season. It just, you know, they just so happen to exist on the same half of the big 10 as Penn state, Michigan, um, and Ohio state. So it'll be, they didn't really get any favors with their two crossover games being, uh, Wisconsin and Purdue, two of the teams that look to be near the top of the Big Ten West standings as well. Yeah, so, I mean, it'll they'll have a gauntlet for sure. I think they do, um, you know, get some wins. You know, it'll kind of be, you know, where they'll, they'll, they'll win some games they weren't supposed to, they'll lose some games they were, weren't supposed to. But I, I don't think... know if they'll win some games they're, they're, they'll win some games they're not supposed to. Yeah. When you look at that schedule, when you look at that schedule, True. Penn well, State, they're going to be the underdog. Rutgers, they're favored. Michigan, underdog. Michigan State, favored ohio state underdog maryland favored wisconsin underdog now do purdue, purdue favored i will say this IU will, IU will be be favored against purdue well right i will say this though some of these games like because i'm not super in on wisconsin so i think oh, if there's a so if there's a game they win that they're not supposed to i'll pick that one because I don't know what the rules are right now as far as if there's going to be – because a lot of these stadiums, a lot of these places is kind of how I feel well, about Ohio. The Big Ten is doing no fans. Okay, so there you it's go. A, it's top to bottom, Big Ten. It does not matter what the state – Okay. State says. Big Ten is no fans. And if there's one game looking at IU's schedule that I could say that they may be favored in that they could lose is Michigan State. Yeah. I don't – who knows what Michigan State's going to look like this year. I mean, they're, they're one of those teams that's a huge toss-up for me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, and, and so like some of these places that they're gonna go play, um, you know, it, you know, it, it's kind of how I feel about Ohio State. Cause I think Ohio State opens on the road against uh, Penn State, right? They're on the road for that game. Uh, you know, no. Oh, okay. Well, Ohio's, Ohio. I mean, IU starts against Penn State. Oh uh, well. At, at IU. Okay, when Ohio State plays Penn State the following week, I knew I, I that's yeah. why I messed up on that. It's at Penn State, right? It is at Penn okay. State. Okay, yeah. okay, that's what I thought. So yeah, um, you know that's a game where like you know in a typical year where you know we go crash kiss of death, that might be one that I pick. And but, also, if you look at it, Penn State does typically start out of the gate pretty slowly. I mean, how many times in the past few years true. have we seen them almost lose to App State, almost lose to Pitt or Kent know, State? Something that they. Case, yeah, Kent State, even. I mean, there's there's been a lot of instances, and those games have been played in Happy Valley. Now, this one's going to be played in Memorial Stadium down in Bloomington. Yeah. Um, so that one could be an interesting one to watch. But ultimately, I think, you know, Penn State always ends up pulling those games out. Right. Um, what, so. I was, what I was going to get into on that as well, though, is just the fact that, 
you have a situation where you're not going to have, you know, some of these places that they go play, it's the added intimidation of having the, the home crowd going oh, into yeah. Death Valley, having to face that whiteout crowd going into Wisconsin. Yeah, so you won't have that. So I think that's why there are some games they could maybe go on the road and, and pick up a win. But, you know, looking at their schedule, you know, going through that, you know, gauntlet, I think they are an improved team. Um, I do think uh, they, you know, I put them at three and five uh, for the season. I think they, I think they lose to Penn State. They beat Rutgers. They lose to Michigan. They um, will beat Michigan State. They'll lose to Ohio State. I think I had them beating Maryland. I think that's their third win. And they you lose. don't have them beating Maryland. That's crazy. Maryland is going to be probably next to Rutgers as the worst team in the Big Ten. Yeah, we need to do that. I know we, 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 we threw out this idea a while ago. Maybe we'll do that after the college football season starts or something. Like the whole everybody's going. Um, because guess what? We're not going to do a fourth preview for Pac- the Pac-12. This is the Pac-12 no. preview as well. <laughs> so, uh, the Pac-12? Oh, you mean that school that plays football after midnight? Yeah. Hey, you know what? I used to love that back in the day when I didn't have anything else going on. And I was like, you know uh, what? Back when we were sitting in... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good old 12, 13 Bethel. Yes. And, uh, you know, just drinking some beer, watching some, you know, Pac-12 football. What beer? Little underage Craig, what beer? No, no, I I was totally, I was totally of age. What are you talking about? Um, Root beer. Yeah, root beer. That's what it was. Um, No, but like, you know, and then it would like eep over into the uh, Hawaii, uh, you know, game that they would have. So you could watch like around the clock football that day Um, or those days. But yeah, um, what happened to the year? What remember? The, oh no, I mean, that was they did that with college basketball where they did like a twenty-four or forty-eight yeah. hour marathon. That was like my junior year, I think, or junior or senior. Yeah, year. I was I was at Ball State then when they did that. I remember trying to pull that off. Oh boy, bad yeah. idea. Yeah, it's it's rough. It got boring. It got boring watching like Winnipeg or, or Quinnipiac or right. whatever some nobody schools play at. 3 a.m. Well, regular season college basketball is is can get pretty boring if it's not a high you know high you know high stakes if matchup. Teams, if it if at least doesn't involve one team that is notable. Yeah. But when you're you got two teams playing basically in a high school gymnasium. Oh. Yeah. At 3 a.m. No, thank you. And no. it's like the the. The JVD team out there for ESPN. <laughs> I mean, you're just like, where did they find these? It's, people? it's the local guys that are like, you want to, you want to do a game on ESPN? Put it on your resume. Uh, Here you go. Boom goes the dynamite. <laughs> um, but yeah, I put them at three and five. I think they'll. Uh, I think IU will be three and five this year, but they'll look good. I just think you know they they do have the tougher schedule, and you know people will look at it and be like, whoa, well you have. You have them losing to Purdue. What's going to happen there? And I, I mean, I just think, like I said, they, they go through a gauntlet of a of a schedule um, this year. Um, they're going to lose, like I said, to Penn State, Michigan, uh, Ohio State, and Wisconsin, um, and then it's Purdue as well. So they're going to look solid. Um, three and five is not going to be super, you know, great to look back on. But I think three ultimately, get you a bowl game. Hey, yeah, we'll get into Rutgers. that. A little... Rutgers is already chalking it up. Rutgers going bowling. So yeah, oh, what are you? Dude, oh, nine. we'll oh, get to nine that. Rutgers going to a bowl game. We'll, we'll get to that here in, in, a, in a little bit because yeah, I'm 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 very surprised. Like because I, I I looked at some bowl projections and I saw that they were like still projecting all 37 bowls. I was like, do we need to have all 37 bowls this even year? If you have all th- even if you have all 37 bowls, it doesn't necessarily mean somebody with a losing record is going to get called up to go to a bowl game because. Guess what? There's only a certain amount of bowls, and there's not enough. There's more football teams than there are bowl matchups. So right, we right. we don't just because everybody's bowl eligible does not mean everybody's going bowling. Right. So Rutgers, don't be packing your bags for some bowl game. You're not going anywhere. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know what their bowl game or what their schedule looks like to be honest for Rutgers. But I well, it, Rutgers is in the same division as IU. Right. So, so the, it's, you know, I mean, it their crossover. I know one of their crossovers is Purdue just because I know the Purdue schedule. Right. But otherwise I don't know who their other crossover is. <laughs> Chalk it up right now. Rutgers is going to go 0 and 8, 0 and 9, and they're going to go to the bowl games. They're going to go to a bowl game. Chalk it they're up right now. They're going to the Bahama Bowl. <laughs> yeah. Cause they're so lucky to go to the Bahama. Because that's where it's going to get, we'll get into a little more later, but like 
that's where it's going to get ske- sketchy too, or could potentially get sketchy, is because you're like, okay, we've got two and seven Rutgers, but we only had three bowl eligible MAC teams. So what do we do? It could it could be it, everybody's bowl eligible. It doesn't matter. It doesn't. I thought you had to be at least five hundred. No, not this year. They are waiving bowl eligibility criteria. Oh, when I looked it up yesterday, it said you had oh, to be. If it is, if it is five hundred, that's great. We'll we'll get more into that later. Yeah, yeah. I'll look so, that up uh, when you uh, as you talk about IU here. So my my prediction for IU, you know, three and five. I I I think IU is going to be a little bit better than that. Honestly, I, I wanted to go three and five. I mean, this team could be as good as five and three, but then also as bad as two and seven or two and six. I'm not going to make a prediction on that ninth game, not knowing who they're. Oh, yeah, that's true. And whatnot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they could be anywhere from two and six all the way up to uh, five and three. I mean, I, I think the, the games that are almost locks for them to, that they'll be underdog in. And I think they will ultimately lose Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State. So there's three losses right there. Rutgers and Maryland, I'm going to chalk those up for wins just because those are arguably the two worst teams in the Big Ten this year. So right there, two and three. So that, that's where you got to build off of there. That Michigan State game, that's a big toss-up for me because that is at Michigan State. Yeah, I know there's no fans. I can't tell you what date that looks like. I mean, that's looking like that could potentially be the second weekend of November. So who knows what the weather could be like up at Michigan, up in East Lansing. I mean, I've seen Purdue go up there in that time of year and it'd be rainy, snowy, just gross. I mean, it's, that's a toss up. Um, Now, if there is a team that is capable of winning in that type of weather, IU is one of those teams because of how much they do rely on the run. Stevie Scott is a very good running back. Um, So that makes them dangerous in that type of weather, but it's still going on the road. IU has not been the best road team regardless. Um, I don't think even no fans is going to be that big of an issue because there's going to be a lot more hoops you're going to have to jump through uh, because of the COVID restrictions and guidelines when you're going on the road. And I think that's going to affect them a little bit. So for right now, I am gonna go, that's a win for IU, mostly because all we can go off of is what we saw from Michigan State last year and they were not very good. Do I think Michigan State's gonna be better this year? Yes, I think they will be much better this year. Um, I think last year the coach uh, just lost them. And you know, that happens, we lost the locker room. And they got a new coach in there now. So, okay, so there's three and three. Then you got Wisconsin and Purdue. You know, I'm going to say Wisconsin gets the win and Purdue gets the win. Um, so, yeah, three and five would seem to be about right. Um, and it's just, that's a tough, it's tough because there are so many question marks with some of these big 10 teams, like with Wisconsin, the biggest question mark, which I'll get into a little bit more here in Purdue because it does matter to Purdue a little bit more. But so there's just a lot of question marks with some of these teams. Biggest one probably in the East division being Michigan state. How are they going to play um, Michigan? How are they going to replace uh, uh, Shea Patterson? I, I think his name was, I don't know. Can you trust Jim, a Jim Harbaugh team? I mean, that could be one of those teams. I mean, IU has taken Michigan down to the wire several times, especially down at IU. Um, so that could be another one to be on upset lookout for as well. I, you know, it's, it's a tough schedule. You just don't know how IU is going to come out and perform this year. Because look, yeah, they have Michael Penix. They're really high on Michael Penix Jr. But he has had injury issues and they do not have – uh, Peyton Ramsey to fall back on. He is now tra- he's transferred. And he's going to be the starting quarterback at Northwestern this year. So that's going to be a, a that's a big loss for them there. Um, so I mean, there's it's just a lot of questions. But I think three and five is a good mark for them. Uh, even potentially four and four. Yeah, I, I think around there will be will be pretty solid. Uh, let's go ahead and move on now to the Purdue Boilermakers. Uh, their outlook 
for the season. Uh, their offense, they re uh, return a pretty stacked receiving core. They've got David Bell back. He caught 86 passes for over 1,000 yards and seven touchdowns after initially opting out. Rondell Moore will be back. Um, there is going to be some question marks at the quarterback position this year, or at least there were heading into the offseason. You had Jack Plummer uh, last season who completed 60% of his passes uh, for 1,500 yards and 11 touchdowns. He did throw eight picks. Then you have Aiden O'Connell who completed 63% of his passes for 1,100 yards, eight touchdowns, four interceptions. They were last in the Big Ten in rushing. Now, they did have so many injuries last season, um, which – I think actually, you know, we, we talked about a lot last year helps them um, for a year like this when, you know, they've got some experience a little bit more. They've got, you know, some guys experience that wouldn't normally have gotten it. Their defense last year, uh, they were last in total defense. They do, however, uh, return um, Ben Holt, who had a, 114 tackles in the sack last year. The no, linebacking core. Ben Holt. They ben don't? Holt, he was a fifth-year grad transfer. I got gotcha. you. Gone. I got you. Well, never mind then. They do, though, have George Karloftis and Derek Barnes, uh, who both had seven and a half sacks. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're good on the defensive line. So that'll be a, a fun team to watch. Um, they're they're uh, scheduled this season. They do start at home against Iowa. Then they will go to Illinois, to Wisconsin, number 16 team. Then they will host Northwestern, be at Minnesota, uh, and then they will play against Rutgers and Nebraska, both at home, and then finish at IU. So um, I'm going to kind of step out of the way, B. Scott, because you're going to, you know, basically just drop the knowledge on me as far as Purdue is concerned. But you go, you go ahead and give your reaction and predictions. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I was I was just going to let you kind of have the floor for a minute. But oh, but, no. but go for it. Go but go yeah, first. no, I, I think this season we look at the schedule. I've got a four and four record for Purdue. Um, I think they're going to. I you know I think. The games I'm concerned about, uh, you know, are Wisconsin, are Minnesota, um, and I think I also had them losing uh, to Iowa as well. Um, I know in the past they've had trouble with Northwestern just in general. That's been kind of a team that's that's given them some uh, given them some heartache. So um, I think they'll they'll lose to Iowa. They'll beat Illinois. They'll lose to Wisconsin. They'll beat Northwestern. They'll lose to Minnesota. Beat Rutgers. Um, and then I, I, maybe I should have had them at five and three because I had, I had a loss in there somewhere, but they'll, if, if anything, they'll be five and three, maybe four and four. Um, I don't think I had them losing to Nebraska. They shouldn't. Um, and then, uh, IU as well, they should uh, get the win there. So maybe I had them losing to, uh, Northwestern or maybe I had them losing to Iowa. Or I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> and so I think they'll be around 500. Um, four and four, five and three around that point. But I do think the uh, the thing that's going to be the the biggest thing for them is the fact that they're going to have um, you know that those guys last year that got some experience. They got some players returning because you know yes, you know they did not play well last year, um, but they've got you know one of the best coaches in the Big Ten and, and uh, Jeff Brom. They've got um, he, Ooh, by the way. Yeah, he's he's got the. He is not going to be coaching this Saturday against Iowa because he is COVID positive. Yep, he's got the Rona, um, so he he will not His be brother, there. His brother Brian Brown is stepping in. Yeah, so that'll be that'll be interesting. I remember watching him at at Louisville. This is this all, that kind of stuff always makes me feel old because I was like I remember watching Brian Brown. I remember watching Brian Brown. Watching Brian Brown lead the Louisville Cardinals into the orange. Bowl. Yeah, against I think Wake Forest was it. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, so, so yeah, it should be fun. But I think I think Purdue uh, has is it going to be about five hundred? Is going to be about a five and three team? Um, I think, like I said, that experience that they got last year. Because when you have those returning players, yes, they're young, but you know you would normally be in a standard year we having that much youth on your team. You'd be a little bit wary, but I think because they were able to play last year, it gets them back in good shape. They've got some good pieces back, so I think, and, and it doesn't hurt that they're on the you know on the more cushier side of the Big Ten as well. So I think, it's, and also the fact that uh, one of the best players in college football decided to come back. Yes. So yeah. Oh yeah. 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 You got Rondell Moore back as well. That so helped a lot. So yeah, I think I think they're they're going to be sitting at four and four, five and three this season. Yeah, I mean that that's that's pretty good. Um, this is going to be a very interesting team to look at this year. There is actually a three man battle at the quarterback position. Obviously, the two that stand out are Jack Plummer and Aiden O'Connell. Jack Plummer was the quarterback that stepped in when uh, Elijah Sindelar went down with an injury on the same play as Rondell Moore last year, 
And then Aiden O'Connell came in in place of an injured Jack Plummer. Aiden O'Connell started the season off as the technically the fourth string walk on, but uh, because of some injuries and a, another quarterback, I, I can't remember. Oh, Nick Sipe uh, ultimately retiring um, because of injuries himself. That vaulted Aiden O'Connell, the little walk on, to uh, the starting position. And Aiden O'Connell had himself a, a, a pretty good. Uh, season when he got under center. I mean, he f- capped off the game against Nebraska and then led a, a game-winning drive a- against Northwestern. Um, he had he had a pretty solid season considering the cast around him was basically freshmen. Uh, that that's very tough. Um, last year it was there was a, a time last year where I believe it was sixteen, maybe a little a bit. It was more. 16 consecutive touchdowns off it, or touchdowns scored by freshmen, true freshmen, well, redshirt freshmen or true freshmen last year. And that's an impressive stat. I mean, obviously that's not a stat you really want to see a lot of because it doesn't help your case for winning a lot of games, but for the future that bodes well. Um, so the quarterback battle, yeah, Jack Plummer, Aiden O'Connell, and uh, transfer uh, Austin Burton from UCLA. So it's a three-man battle there. Jeff Brom did say today that they have their quarterback. They know who's going to be their starting quarterback. They've named him internally, but they're not going to let everybody know until the, the first snap of the game on Saturday, which makes sense. You don't want Iowa preparing for one quarterback. You want them to be preparing for three. Um, obviously, the big storyline was the fact uh, Rondell Moore opted out and then opted back in once the season became back on. So Purdue fans are finally going to get to see that what if of um, a healthy Rondell Moore and a healthy healthy David Bell on the field at the same time, that's going to give Big Ten defenses nightmares. It's going to give uh, defensive coordinators in the Big Ten a lot of sleepless nights trying to prepare for that because not only do you have to worry about David Bell and Rondell Moore, but Purdue is just stacked at the wide receiver position. It's probably one of the best, if not the best wide receiver room in the entire country, maybe outside of say Alabama um I mean there's just there's a lot of talent there that you don't when you think of it you think of Rondell Moore and David Bell obviously but there's still a lot more talent in that room stacked with four-star wide receivers um another one of the most unspoken returnees of this season is uh defensive tackle Lorenzo Neal sat out all of last season with an injured knee his return is huge in more ways than one he's a big guy so that's huge <laughs> i mean he's a he's a big he's a he's a, a a gap eater essentially but purdue did hire uh they parted ways with nick holt last year their defensive coordinator and brought in new defensive corner bob diaco uh from louisiana tech formerly also at nebraska uh, Bob Diaco does run the 3-4, but he's also going to run a hybrid 4-3. So it's going to be a combo of 3-4, 4-3 this year. And Lorenzo Neal fills in perfectly in a 3-4 nose tackle uh, position. He's that he's the prototypical nose tackle. Is exactly the type of player you want in that position. Um, so that's going to be a really big deal because he is going to command a lot of attention from offensive lines, which is then going to open up um, – the ability, a bit more abilities for George Karloftis and Derek Barnes this year. Uh, when Purdue is in the 3-4, Derek Barnes is actually going to drop back into his more natural position of linebacker, but he's going to be a rushbacker at that point. Um, linebacker is still a bit of a question mark for the Boilermakers this year. They did bring in a junior college transfer that is set to uh, play some very significant minutes and provide a lot of pass rush. He said he's going to be playing, I believe he said the dog, position uh basically he, he's a bigger linebacker he if he needs to he can put his hand down in the dirt and he can also stand up so um there, there's gonna be some good size for purdue um at the linebacker position but still some question marks there the secondary may be one of those positions where purdue is actually going to have quite a bit of depth uh they lost some players that may not have been able to see as much uh, playing time this year as they did in the past few seasons but they did bring in one of the top junior college transfers in the secondary, as well as they got um, an immediate transfer, immediate eligibility transfer, DJ Johnson from Iowa. 
transferred out of Iowa during the whole uh, racial discrimination saga going on there. Um, his waiver got cleared today by the Big Ten. It had already been previously cleared by the NCAA. So he is cleared to play on Saturday against his former team, Iowa. Um, that's a that's a big gain for the Boilermakers. This is a third year player who is technically a redshirt sophomore. So he still has three years of eligibility ahead of him. He knows the Iowa system. He's from Indianapolis, but he's got three years of college practice and you know training under his belt. So that's a huge pickup in the secondary there for the Boilermakers. Offensively, obviously the quarterback battle, you know, I, I don't really, I don't think I can say who I believe is going to be the front runner. I mean, if I had to take a wild guess, it's going to be Jack Plummer because he is that prototypical quarterback that Jeff Brom is looking to employ. He does have a bit more mobility to him than Aiden O'Connell. The wild card in all of this is definitely Austin Burton, um, who has had some extended time now to get into the, the playbook. Um, he only played really one game for UCLA. Um, UCLA was a, a garbage team last year, so you can't really take too much away from his stats in that game. But he did look really good. He's got the mobility that Jeff Brom likes from a quarterback, plus has the ability to stand in the pocket and really sling the ball around. So he's the wild card. I can't really say what, he, what to expect from him there, if he could be the starter. He very well could be the starter. And I don't, I wouldn't know what to expect. And I think if he ends up being the starter, that could be a worst case scenario for Iowa because you don't have much film on him and you don't have any film on him in a Purdue using running the Purdue playbook. So this is, and then obviously wide receiver we've talked about offensive line it is the same offensive line returning. Um, they did get a transfer from um, Colorado state. We'll see how well he can uh, assimilate himself in, oh no, from uh, UTEP. It was from UTEP, not Colorado State, uh, from UTEP. Um, so we'll see how well he can assimilate himself in there as well. I do believe the offensive line will take a step forward. They were young and inexperienced last year. There is now some depth on the offensive line. Um, you know, I think they're going to be, they're probably going to be one of the more improved units of this entire Purdue roster, uh, mostly because of the, it's going to be the same starting five most likely there and you know they're going to be another year improved um running back i think you will see the running back running backs play better because the offensive line will play better and the passing game will be a, a lot more involved this year um also running stats should be better if rondell moore is taking any snaps in the backfield as well but you are going to see some improvement from King, from sophomore King Daru, plus true freshman uh, Tyrek Murphy. He um, come, is a four-star recruit out of the state of New York and has some true speed to him. Obviously, you've got the big bruising back in Xander Horvath. So there, there's a good change of pace between all these different running backs that Purdue has that can really cause some trouble for these defensive fronts because what you're going to see against with these defenses that are not going to be able to stack the box and just try to stop the run they're going to be spread across the field now trying to stop david bell rondell moore and you know milton wright and just, just name it it's going to be there um so i think that's going to open up more opportunities in the run game as well looking at this schedule obviously I do believe Purdue did get one of the easier draws out of the entire Big Ten. It's probably the easiest schedule in the entire Big Ten. I don't, and that's not just being a Purdue fan. I think when you look at it statistically, top to bottom, that it is the one of the easier schedules. You know, this is a team that could very well, depending on how they how they come out and perform. There, you know, there's still a lot of question marks. New defense, how that how that transition goes. This could be a team that could, you know, potentially be a three and five team. And this is also a, a team that could go all the way up to seven and one, pushing potentially eight and no. When you look at their schedule, I do believe they come out and they do win against Iowa. I know the deck seems kind of stacked against them. Purdue has, under Jeff Brom, has not won an opening season game. Um, you know, they don't have Jeff Brom on the sidelines this, this year for this game because of his COVID uh, diagnosis. But. Iowa's under a little bit of turmoil themselves. They're breaking in a new quarterback, and that's going to be tough. And they, 
there's going to be a lot of question marks with them. They don't know what Purdue is going to look like running the three, four. They don't, they, they have, a, they just, there's a, not a lot of film out there for them on that type of thing to see either. So I, I do think honestly though, Purdue does rally around the fact that Jeff Brom has COVID. They're going to rally around their coach and pull out the W week one at Illinois. Um, honestly, I think Purdue goes in there and wins that one. Uh, last year, I think that was just a fluke. I mean, they were playing in the, in the middle of a, a hurricane. It, it seemed like, and um it was just one of those games that, you know, they lost that they should, they, one of those that they should have won that game, but they are always good for one of those each year. But I feel like this year that the injuries can stay under control, that that won't be a, as much of an issue. Week three at Wisconsin. So like I said earlier, Wisconsin is one of the biggest question marks in the entire big 10 um, new quarterback. How do you replace um, Quint, your top wide receiver in Quintez Cephas? How, and then the biggest question, how do you replace Jonathan Taylor? I think for the first time in a long time, typically when Wisconsin is graduating out or losing one of their, their star running back, they always have another star running back waiting in the wings. Whether, you know, Monty Ball to James White or whatever it may be, you know, so on and so on. It just seems like there's always just that continuous cycle of really top-notch running backs coming out of Wisconsin. Well, what's funny, too, is is uh, there, this was one of the Memory Lane episodes, if you want to go watch that, the one where they beat Nebraska 70 to, like, 30. Um, they At one point, I forgot that they had James White, too. So at one point, they had James White, Monty Ball, and uh, Melvin Gordon. So yeah. they've, they've, had, they've had some solid running backs, for sure. Yeah, but this is the first time that they really haven't had that next guy up, that next – back that you go oh my gosh it, typically when you see a wisconsin running back go out you go you, you would think oh man who glad he's gone no no they always, they always have somebody there ready to go hmm. I, I they don't have that this time around there's not that person that you go yeah they lost so and so but here comes the next one they, they don't have that this time around so there, there's some big question marks with wisconsin and wisconsin's gonna have to figure that out they're gonna have a different identity almost on offense um it's going to be interesting to see how that goes. And are they going to pull out the, the former five-star quarterback and let him sling it around there? I think his name is Graham Mertz. Um, so that will be interesting to see. I'm going to give Purdue the win there because Purdue has been close the past couple of years. Even last year when they went up to Wisconsin and were really bit banged up, they did put on – they gave Wisconsin a good run for their money. And obviously Jonathan Taylor just beat you down uh, – significantly but I, I there's not that jonathan taylor there anymore so i think purdue finally gets over that hurdle i think purdue wins against northwestern northwestern is going to be better than they were last year but still a lot of they're not as they're not going to be as good as they were a couple of years ago at number 24 minnesota minnesota probably will be ranked around there again i don't think they're going to win week one um, again at home against michigan but that late in the season at Minnesota, it could very well be snowing. And the last time Purdue went up to Minnesota and they were playing in a blizzard, they got thumped, absolutely thumped. So that one I'm going to chalk up as actual as a loss for Purdue. But that's one that if the weather is good, Purdue could ultimately win, could c come out of that game with a victory. But Purdue has yet to win at TCF Bank Stadium. That's <laughs> that's scary. So you know I'm going to I'm going to give uh, I'm going to give Minnesota the win there. Rutgers, we're not even going to talk about that one. Purdue wins. Nebraska at, at, uh, in West Lafayette. Purdue should win that one. Um, it's going to be a, a competitive game. It usually is. So I, I'm going to give that one to Purdue. And then at IU, ultimately, I think Purdue's offense is going to be really clicking. You're going to see the defense playing with their ears pinned back and having their, understanding their identity by that point. I'm going to give Purdue the win there. So – I have Purdue based on that. I mean, that this is best case scenario. That's seven and one. I mean, this is still a team that could honestly Illinois lose to Wisconsin, lose to Minnesota, and you know, lose to Northwestern. I mean, this is a team that could potentially go as bad as three and five, as good as seven and one. Really good would be eight and no. Oh. But ultimately, this is a Purdue team that very well could be knocking on the door of playing in Indianapolis for the Big Ten Championship because there's not because they're that good, but because there's so many other question marks surrounding the other teams within the Western Division in the Big Ten. I mean, Minnesota's got a lot to replace as well. 
Uh, nobody's really talking about that. Yeah, they returned Tanner Morgan, but they lost. I mean, they, they lost quite a bit, especially on the defensive side of things. So that'll be an interesting, um, some interesting games to, to look out for. Uh, you know, I'm saying as good as seven and one or as bad as three and five. Hey, that's not too shabby at all. I mean, and, I, and I, I'm with you. I mean, you know, there's there's some games on that schedule that, you know, could potentially flip the other way. And and, and it'll be it'll be fun, a fun season to watch. And I think this is a season going into it where the Big Ten maybe is not as as deep and as stacked as they have been the last few years. So I think really anything could happen. I could see Purdue. I mean, heck, they were, was it last year or the year before where they were actually in position to, it wasn't last year, so it had to be the year before, where they were in position to to possibly go to Indianapolis with like three games left. And they ended up not going, obviously, but I think that was the year Northwestern went. Um, it was, yeah, it was two years ago when all they really needed to do was knock off Wisconsin and wisconsin ultimately won in three overtimes yeah so it'll it'll be a fun season to watch and i'm excited we get some uh purdue and and iu football back because now that means we don't just have to talk about notre dame if we talk about local <laughs> local college football and notre um, dame doesn't think they're local true true well uh before we get into hot or cold uh before we you know get into that and wrap up tonight's podcast let's go ahead and get these words from our sponsors The Crash Course Podcast is brought to you by Anchor. Looking to start a podcast but don't know where to start? Look no further than Anchor.fm. Anchor allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your computer or mobile device and will distribute it to other sites such as Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. On a budget, not only is Anchor completely free of charge, but will allow you to make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. Download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor.fm to get started. Anchor, it's everything you need in a podcast in one place. Even though this is a presidential election, there are many more candidates on the ballot. Ballot Ready is a nonpartisan guide to your entire ballot where you can compare candidates based on stances, biography, or endorsements. From there, you can save your choices to use when you vote by mail or in the voting booth. You can even request your absentee ballot or make a plan to vote early. This year, with changes to polling places and vote-by-mail laws as a result of COVID, it's more important than ever to have a plan to vote. This election matters. Make sure you have a plan to make an informed vote. Go to BallotReady.org and enter your address to make a plan to vote today. We do have some breaking news. I know this will be a shocker, a shocker to you, B. Scott, but you were right, by the way. I What I was looking at was apparently uh, a little bit more outdated information. Uh, so every team is eligible this year. So I thought they had to be 500. What I looked at, I looked at an article yesterday, but it must have been a little bit older. But yeah, earlier this week, it was ruled that all teams are bull eligible. So that will be interesting. Um, so... Uh, let's go ahead and hop into hot or cold. We've got four questions uh, to dive into tonight. First question is, uh, Ohio State will represent the Big Ten in the college football playoff. I say that is a hot take. Um, you know, there are question marks all across the Big Ten this season, really with both the Big Ten and the Pac-12 um, as far as you know, conferences are concerned. Now, of course, the Big Ten, I think, has better teams than the Pac-12. But, um, I mean, you've got question marks with Purdue. You've got question marks with Wisconsin, Penn State. Uh, all the teams that you could think potentially might be in a position to also represent um, the Big Ten, you know, it, you know, up in the rankings and, and being knocking on the door of the Big Ten or the uh, college football playoff. But, you know, at the end of the day, what has me going with the Ohio State Buckeyes as the eventual winners of the Big Ten this season is just the fact they've got the best quarterback in Justin Fields. They've got the best coach in Ryan Day, or at least one of the best coaches in the conference. Um, they've got that great, that great combo. Um, it is a toss-up um, that they've got against Penn State, um, and so uh, I think uh, they will win that game. And like I said, the fact that, it, yes, it will be on the road, but it will not be your typical at Penn State game, or else I probably would be more inclined to say, hey, they're gonna, they might get knocked off here, um, especially because I think we've already seen this through, and this is kind of what I've anticipated with conference only scheduling. We've seen, you know, these two these teams um, like the LSU's of the world losing at Missouri and losing to Texas A and M or whoever they lost. I think they lost to Texas A and M. Maybe it wasn't A and M, but they lost two games this season. Um, you've got, you know these teams that you know you've seen Oklahoma lose a couple of times this year and it's it's I think it's it's different when it's conference only when you know 
when like every week, you know, you've got an opportunity to, you know, basically, you know, get higher up in the standings, do whatever. I mean, it's a lot different um, than hey, you know what, we're gonna play this week. It's probably gonna be a loss, and the next week we play Chattanooga. It's a lot different um, than a typical year, and so. Um, you know, I think this is a year where Ohio State could lose a game, could lose potentially. I mean, two losses would probably not get them into the college football playoff. But this is a year where I, even if they don't look as strong, I think they still, um, you know, are the front runners to get there. And like I said, Penn State, um, if it was a full capacity, it's kind of how I feel about Notre Dame and Clemson. If the stadium was full capacity, I might be more compa- compelled to maybe pick the upset there. But I'm going with Ohio State. And I've got no faith in Minnesota or Wisconsin, who, in my opinion, are the front runners to win. Um, on the other side of the Big Ten. So um, I think ultimately Ohio State, who, you know, like I said, has some question marks. They have to return or they have to replace, you know, uh, you know, they have to replace Chase Young. They have to replace, um, you know, the, you know, J.K. Plays a lot on their side as well, but it's still Ohio State. They seem to reload more than they rebuild. So I, I'm going with the Ohio State Buckeyes to represent the Big, tw- uh, Big Ten in the uh, in the college football playoff. Yeah, I agree. I think I agree. Um, I think it's definitely a hot take. Until somebody can prove me wrong, Ohio State is the class of the Big Ten, to be honest, especially this year. Justin Fields is back. Sean Wade is back. I mean, yeah, they did lose J.K. Dobbins. Uh, they, it's, this is still a very good team. This is probably one of the best teams in college football. I mean, pr- prior to the Big Ten canceling their season, uh, they were ranked in the top three in the, in the country, I think they were even top two. Um, so this is a very, very good team that has the ability, I think, to not only represent the Big Ten, but win the whole thing as well. Um, so yeah, this is definitely, this is easily a hot take. Yeah, the toss up game is against Penn State, but it is early on in the season. And like I mentioned earlier, Penn State does seem to struggle out of the gate early in the season. Um, now Ohio State is used to playing like Miami of Ohio early in the season so um they may struggle a bit too but hey at least ohio state has played the likes of like virginia tech oklahoma and so they had on. oregon on the docket this year too yeah they had oregon they've played usc before so they, they they know how to play these tough games early in the season at least they got their uh warm-up game against rutgers this weekend um yeah, completely. Yeah, that'll that'll be that'll basically be like playing Miami of Ohio this weekend. Um, so you've got uh, you know, question number two: Oregon will win the Pac-12. So I I debated what question I wanted to do for the Pac-12 because I wanted to hit on them. We're not like I said, we're not doing a standalone show for the Pac-12, but I wanted I wanted to talk about them, and I was, I I thought it was too mean to be like, does it really matter? Who wins the Pac-12 this year? Because it really honestly doesn't. Um, but will Oregon win the Pac-12? The only reason why I'm saying Oregon is because they're the highest ranked, or else I would have, I would, basically no matter what, I would have, would have asked about the highest ranked team. Um, and so for me, I think it's a hot take because I trust the rankings. I trust the experts out there that have had, you know looked at the teams you know with a fine-tooth comb and said, hey, you know what? I think they're the 13th best team in college football, which I think is where they're at right now. And they won't play a ranked team all season. I don't. I think Oregon is the and the USC are the only two ranked teams in the Pac-12, and they're on opposite sides of the of the Pac-12. So there's a potential that you know, heck, I, there is a chance that. Oregon and USC are undefeated playing each other in the Pac-12 title game. The winner does go to the college football playoff. I don't think it'll happen. Um, you'd be hard-pressed. I mean, basically, basically the Pac-12 needs uh, Oklahoma State to either lose – Oklahoma State to lose or have uh, Ohio State lose two games and then also go undefeated to get into the pack to get into the college football Eventually, the pack 12 needs both osus to lose twice yeah basically so um yeah they because do the pack 12 has just been a shell of themselves and haven't been in in like four years so um it's not really gonna matter too much but i'm gonna just go i'm gonna go chalk i'm gonna go with the experts and i've got oregon uh, but I don't think it'll matter now. It will be an interesting story if they do go undefeated, and then you've got like a one-loss SEC or a one-loss Big Ten team in front of them, and, well, hey, we were undefeated. We're a power conference, but, yeah, I don't think it's going to matter. Yeah, I'm going to say it's a hot take as well. I mean, why not? 
<laughs> it's it's one of those organs probably going to lose somewhere along the way, maybe even twice. Now, I don't know. here's what I'll say: typically, an organ season, like you look at last year's organ season, there are two losses because they did win they did win the Pac-12 last year. There are two losses in the regular season. Their first loss was to Auburn. Don't have to worry about the non-conference this year. And their other loss was to Arizona. Now, in Arizona, Arizona State. So, I don't think they play Arizona State this year. They might. But the fact of the matter is is that, like, you, Oregon was in a position where they knew they kind of had to press a little bit more um, because they were fighting for, you know, State. Because I think at that point they had risen back up in the rankings. Um, you know, they were. I think they were a top 10, top 15 team when they played Arizona State. So they knew, like, hey, if we're an undefeated Pac-12 team, maybe we have a shot. And so maybe the fact that, you know, they're like, hey, we gotta, you know, we can't lose this game. Pressure gets on a little bit. So I, I think the fact that they're like, okay, you know what, we go seven and zero. You know, be one that whole cliche that the Colts use. You know, be one and zero every week. You know, maybe we've got a shot. So I think the shortened season actually plays better for Oregon to possibly run the table. But I don't think it'll matter. I, I think I think it is also very possible that they will lose a game they shouldn't to like Cal early in the season and not make it. Honestly, I think one of the teams to look out for in the Pac-12 is Utah. They're always one of those. They're always one of those sneaky good teams. Um, they could really play spoiler for. They could play spoiler. I think in the Pac-12 for somebody. Um, but you know, it, it is. It's tough. I'll be honest. I don't know too much about the Pac-12. No. Yeah, I mean, yeah. There's not a whole lot to to go off of with them and and it's it's kind of sad because i remember we it's a far cry from the heyday of the pac-12 when you had you know not like the recent heyday but when you had like marcus Mariota and andrew luck and all these you know guys yeah you had a lot more talent over there so yeah but yeah i i think it's i think it's oregon it'll be interesting to see what some other teams do and you know what i'm i i'm pulling for whoever wins the pac-12 to be undefeated or to have a good season just because I think it shakes things up a lot more, but there's also a very real possibility that we could be looking at a two or three loss Pac-12 champion. Um, question number three, the Big Ten slash Pac-12 seasons will end on time. So for me, this is a cold take. Um, they, there are no delays. With, with no delays, the Big Ten and the Pac-12 title games will be played a day before the college football playoff selection. So that could possibly... Uh, not bode very well. There's no bye weeks to make up games, as we've seen. I mean, you know, every every league that has started uh, since the pandemic, with the exception of the NBA, who is in a bubble, um, has had some sort of delay. Had to have some sort of makeup season, uh, makeup games. We saw in Major League Baseball the Marlins, to a greater extent the Cardinals, who basically had to play like ten double headers in the last like twenty days to make up games. Um, we've seen it in the NFL this season with games getting rescheduled. We had a game, you know, Monday at five. Um, we had a game last Tuesday uh, for the NFL, um, and I think they're ultimately at some point going to feel the the pressure of, well, hey, we've had like the same team get, you know, the same. There's a team that had a massive outbreak and they had to miss two weeks. What do we do then? So the fact that they don't have any, you know, areas to make up games now, college football has been a little bit more cavalier of just canceling games, but that's usually been for non-conference. So it'll be interesting to see what they do. Um, but the odds are that some COVID-related delays or cancellations or postponements may happen, and I don't know. I mean, do you delay the college football selection committee for you know for two conferences i mean i don't think the pac-12 will factor in i think they're just fine moving on without the pac-12 but do you move on you know if, if, if ohio state's undefeated but they've got a makeup game you know december 27th or december 21st or whenever you know the next day or or t you know a week later you know what happens or if the big 10 championship is you know the the you know first weekend in january because they've had so many delays you know what will what how will that all pan out uh it, it'll be very interesting and and uh to to watch but i think it's it's very unrealistic to think that there that there will be no delays and they'll go through an entire season and be fine i'm going to go say this is a this is a hot take um 
I can't speak for the Pac-12, but I know with the guidelines set in place by the Big Ten, um, one of the reasons to not have fans in the stands was to give them the flexibility to be able to, if they if a game for some reason cannot be played on a Saturday, they can move it to a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Also perks of having your own network. You know, you're not gonna lose out on the TV potential, a lot of, you're gonna lose out on some TV revenue if it's a marquee game, but it's still gonna have, it's still gonna be on TV. Um, honestly, in the, I think games will ultimately just be canceled. I don't think they're gonna be postponed truly if it's a big time outbreak, because one of the things the Big Ten has put into place is if you can track COVID, you are in a, as a player, you are in a 21 day quarantine, 21 days. Um, luckily, because that you're not, your roster management's not gonna be as big of a deal this year because everybody is being given a free year of eligibility. So a lot of true freshmen are probably going to see a lot of playing time in situations where upperclassmen at their positions um, have contracted COVID and are, are out for a game or two or potentially three. So that, that by have, allowing everybody to have a free year of eligibility, that basically opens the rosters up significantly. You're not going to have to worry about roster management of, okay, I only want this, I, this guy can play four games and then, we have to pull them because we don't want them to burn a red shirt year. Um, so those are the types of things you're, that are going to help the Big Ten and the Pac-12 stay on schedule. Um, does that mean games are always going to be played on the date and time that they were originally scheduled to play? No. But I don't think you're going to have anything go past that December 19th final game played. I don't think you're going to have anything past that. Um, I think they will move things around and during week, uh, in the weeks leading up to that. I, I do believe that, that that could potentially be an option, but I don't think you're going to have anything played past December 19th. They wanted to get, make sure they get everything in. Uh, so the college football playoff selection committee has everything that they need. So what happens if it's, you know, the week of the, Big Ten championship game and Ohio State playing Purdue contracts COVID or not COVID, but like well, let's say there's a couple players that do contract COVID and they can't play for a week. Then those players don't play for a week, right? But like, if you've got uh, an like outbreak, your team is not going to quarantine. An entire team, it's not going to be like it is in the NFL where, oh, so their starting quarterback and three staffers caught it. We're shutting this game down until further notice. It's not going to be like that. These these okay. rosters they are bigger than NFL rosters. Right. To be honest with you, um, it, it it's they have put into place a contact tracing that is so intense that it's if somebody comes down with it, it may be two or three other people that may have to go into a smaller quarantine um, until you know if they have like a certain amount of negative tests in a row, then they'll be okay. But it's only players that can track it have to do a 21 day quarantine. I got you. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so final question, um, and this is going to be tweaked a little bit because I originally when I originally wrote I didn't have uh, the correct information, so my apologies there. Um, but I am fine with uh, a 500 or lower team making it to a bowl game. Um, because it is, you know, what I had read earlier is that you had to be 500. Um, it actually is, it was announced earlier this past week that um, you, it, basically every team is eligible to make a bowl game, um, which means there is, an to fill up the bowls, you could have a potential of, you know, if the, if the you know, Mac. You could have an 0-9 Rutgers team. You could have, yeah. If, if, if the uh, Little Caesars Bowl or wherever it's called now you know, doesn't have technically a Big Ten team available. Yes, you could have winless Rutgers against winless Ball State in the uh, <laughs> in the Little Caesars Bowl. Um, but for me, uh, this is a cold take. I mean, I'm not sitting here saying I'm outraged and, and want to go, uh, you know, protest on the uh, NCAA, you know, steps. But, um, you know, it, it is something that, you know, I, I think they should, requ should have required a little bit more because I think ultimately due to the pandemic – 
I think most bowl games are more risk than reward because on the one hand, you know, it's kind of like what we've talked about with Tampa Bay is, you know, these bowl games are used to not really having a whole lot of fans, at least a lot of the lower level ones. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, a, a lot of the bowl games like the Little, Little Caesars Bowl, like the, you know, like the Bahamas Bowl, like, you know, those kind of bowl games, um, you know, at the kind of the bottom tier, they're typically not the fullest stadiums. Um, and then you're also having teams that, you know, they, they have to travel. So there's not that regional base that you see, um, you know, during the regular season, which is going to happen anyway with, you know, the playoff and everything like that. But, um, you know, I think it's more of a risk to reward, you know, it's kind of like, you know, B Scott, you're saying like, as long as they can have that extra practice time, I would have been all for that. Um, you know, saying, Hey, you know, we're going to have, instead of 37 bowl games, we're going to have 20 and, you have to be you have to have a winning record um and you you know but the teams that you know are bull eligible or you know or also had winning records that didn't make it or something like that or had or were 500 and didn't make it they get extra practice time because at least I, like that would be something to play for so because if you had like going into the last week of the season the max season is six games this season if ball state's two and three and toledo's two and three and they play each other in the last week of the season that's at least something to play for because whoever wins that game gets the extra practice time they would have had for bowl games so i think that that would have been you know kind of something a little bit better um also although we know this is all about the money and you know being able to have like the teams on tv and that kind of thing but um, just kind of from a more practical sense, I think that would have been a lot better. Um, I would have been 100% more in favor of fewer bowl, uh, bowl games and expanded playoffs. Um, we saw, you know, we've seen, you know, one league already do it this year uh, with Major League Baseball. I know that the NBA season wasn't over, but instead of going right to playoffs or having some sort of like exhibition, they invited 22 teams to the bubble, which I know isn't technically expanded playoffs, although they did have nine, those playing games. Um, this is the first year that the NFL is going to have 14, although that was regularly scheduled. Um, so I think if you were going to test out eight teams, this would have been the year. Uh, you know, you're going to always hear me clamoring for the eight teams, B. Scott. So, uh, I don't think you're ever going to avoid that. But, uh, but yeah, I, I would have been hundred percent. I think this would have been the year to do eight teams, uh, in the college football playoff, uh, just because, Hey, I mean, why not? Why, if you're going to test it and see how it works, why not try it? Um, and, uh, I think this would have been the year to do it. Um, I would have been much more in favor of that than, Hey, it's, it's, uh, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to have 37 bowl games and maybe you'll see a team with a winning record. Maybe you'll see two teams that won two games the entire season. All right. So since the question kind of got changed up, I'll just come I'll, This is what my answer is. I'm, I'm not a hundred, I'm not okay with allowing just basically saying everybody qualifies I mean, obviously, if everybody qualifies, not in every bowl does get played, not everybody will make it to a bowl game. I know there are still some conferences, some smaller conferences, I don't think are playing. So that will open up some matchups or some potential bowl slots for other teams that are playing. Um, ultimately, I do think some of these smaller tier bowl games will cancel. I don't think they'll be played because the monetary factor of it it's going to be more expensive to put the game on than it would be than what they're going to get out of it um and that's going to open up a whole lot of can of worms with sponsors blah 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 i know but ultimately i think some of these bowl games smaller tier bowl games will ultimately get canceled i think even the bahamas bowl is one of those that potentially it's either going to have to get played somewhere else or be canceled altogether right because of travel restrictions. But yeah, I'm not okay with everybody being bowl eligible automatically. I think you need to at least be 500 because if the if it's a normal season, six and six gets you into a bowl game. So whether, and it's not your fault if your conference went with a smaller season than other conferences, if you can go 500 in your conference and your schedule, you deserve to be in a bowl game. That's like going six and six. Yeah, I mean, on your schedule. Now, on it. Now, obviously, it's going to be a little difficult for a Big Ten team to go five hundred when you're playing nine games. Everybody's playing nine games, um, so that means you're either going to have a winning record or a losing record. But I think after that original eight, if you are five hundred, I think you should be 
considered for a bowl game. I think because honestly, after a regular season, if you're six and six, you're bowl eligible. And that's 500. If you're 500, you're bowl eligible. And so I have no problem. I wouldn't have any problem if they said you have to be at 500. Um, well, I mean, because uh, also, like, how been... hard is that? If you're, like, a MAC team, Mac, MAC teams play six games this year. So all we're asking you to have but, is three wins. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and that's true. But at the same time, look at the number of slots the MAC has to fill. It's not very many. I right. Mean, I'm just using not... them as an example. But... I know, but, I mean – I mean, look at, that's just one of those things I look at and not, you know, I don't think there's going to be enough, I don't think there's going to be enough slots for all these eligible teams, just like there is on a regular year. I mean, one of our years at Ball State, Ball State was what, seven and five and bowl eligible, very good team left on the outside. Look, they were left outside. Yeah not make a bowl game and they were one of those teams that probably should have made a bowl game over some other six and six team or there's been years where there haven't been enough six and six teams and we've seen losing record teams get in a five and seven team get in because there wasn't enough i think there was one year i think it was like the pistachio bowl or whatever it is um in san francisco you really need to have the pistachio bowl I i think it was like illinois and ucla and both teams were five and seven i think yeah so and nobody tuned into that one. No. Not so. even fans of their own teams. Yeah, they're like, you know what? We'll, we'll catch the highlights. It's fine. <laughs> it's not a big deal. So, Craig, before we wrap things up, I want to add one more question in here. Okay. Just quick take. This Sunday, the IndyCar season wraps up. Who is your ulti- Who's your champion? Scott Dixon or Joseph Newgarden? Uh, I got to stick with Scott Dixon. There you go. We mentioned him. That means our podcast numbers will be through the roof this week. Uh, because every time we put it in the title, <laughs> yeah, put it in the title. Why Scott Dixon will be the best player in the Big Ten this season? Uh, <laughs> but no, I I think I'm gonna go with Scott Dixon. I mean, I've rolled with him all year, and has he won every race that I've predicted him to win? No, and yeah, you could say, hey, you know what? Of course, you're going with the guy that's you know got you know basically you know a favorite to possibly win it, but um, he's just had. Well, it's only it's down to two drivers, right? Well, I'm just saying, like, that would be, I I would imagine, the favorite is is Scott Dixon with the kind of year he's had. But, um, yeah. So I'm going with Scott Dixon. I think uh, he's had a a fantastic year, and I can't wait to wrap up the season um, next week because that'll be one of the topics of the podcast next week. Yeah, for me, you know, I'm I'm going with Scott Dixon as well. I would really like to see Joseph Newgarden pull it off and be a back to back champion and get his third in uh, basically four years. Um, but I don't know all the scenarios, but it, I feel like majority of the scenarios are really stacked in favor of Scott Dixon. I feel like Scott Dixon just basically has to finish the race. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. I mean, it's, it's one hey. of those deals. I mean, he could have wrapped it up a few weeks ago at the Harvest, at, in the Harvest GP. Um, and it came pretty darn close to that. So I, I think... I think ultimately Scott Dixon is going to pull it out and, you know, be this year's IndyCar champ. I mean, totally deserving. I mean, the way he started the season, unbelievable. So yeah, I'm, I'm going with, with Scott Dixon. Um, I think like Joseph Newgarden has to like win the race and Scott Dixon has to finish outside of the top five. I don't know. It's, this, the odds are really stacked against Joseph Newgarden, but if anybody can pull it off, it is Joseph Newgarden, let's be honest. But, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going with, with Scott Dixon. Yeah, it should be a fun race. Like I said, can't wait to uh, recap the season uh, next week on the podcast. That will do it for this week's edition of the Crash Course Podcast. Remember, you can follow us at Crash Course FM on Twitter. Um, you can follow us uh, on our YouTube channel if you want to go subscribe there, Crash Course Podcast. Like us on Facebook, Crash Course Podcast. You're detecting a theme here. Uh, basically, just search Crash Course Podcast on social media and you'll find us. Um, you can also listen weekly um, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever podcasts can be heard. B. Scott, where can uh, they find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, Brandon underscore Scott 87. Next week, we'll be talking about the World Series as well as the end to the 